service for others. And when we talk about that, I think I just want to just, just go over just a couple brief takeaways from that. One of the things about doing that is I think you know we recognize about being Christ for others, but the, the one thing that I wanted to emphasize about being the, the, what was referred to as that sacrament of the present moment. And that was from that 300-year-old book by John Pierre de Cassade. He spoke about this. And he said this about the sacrament of the present moment. He said, what God arranges for us to experience at every moment is the best and holiest thing that could ever happen to us. Because in the present moment, in this very present moment, the will of God is now manifesting itself in these circumstances which is the duty of the present moment. All of our moments, then, are made productive by obeying the will of God, which reveals itself in thousands and thousands of different ways, and each of which successfully becomes our immediate duty. We have to do nothing except allow God's holy will to work in us and to surrender ourselves blindly with absolute confidence. We don't need to come up with strategies. We don't need to prepare programs or ministries, you know, to broaden ourselves with weights too great for us to carry. All we have to do is to remain close to God in prayer and the sacraments, and then abandon ourselves to do His will in the moment. Sounds simple, right? Tough but sounds simple. So all we do is just recognize every moment and right now I'm going to do what God is telling me to do. Maybe not what I feel like doing, but what God is telling me to do in this present moment. So, you know, for the present moment is what God wants for us to be able to experience in the present moment and to be able to bring the people of God closer to God. You know, every day is a gift. That's why we call it the present moment, you know, and so that's what we're called to do. We're also called to proclaim the Word of God. You know, how do we proclaim Christ to others? Not just bring Christ to others, how do we proclaim Christ to others? You know, you know how do, we are all called to bring the truth of God to others. And we are all called to be evangelists in our own ways, you know, and we do this not only by talking to people and not talking, but really listening to where they are. We see this often in Jesus. He listens attentively, and then he speaks to people, and he speaks to people in their brokenness, and he, we can speak from our brokenness in order to be able to allow ourselves to proclaim God's word. Because we proclaim God's word to what they need to hear. Because that's what Jesus did. He came to heal them and to bring them and tell them what they needed in the present moment. Again, you know, we just aren't just going to go and just got our stick and we're going to say it and move on and proclaim this. We need to be able to be, again, not only present, but be able to be able to listen to people. And to welcoming people, we recognize that we have so much more in common with people than we do have differences with people because we are all part of, you know, this family of faith. We are all part of the body of Christ. And so we need to open ourselves to others. And with welcoming, we talk about opening ourselves up to hospitality. And what does a good host do? The good host provides for the needs of the people that come to him. And we need to be able to assess what those needs are. You know, you're part of the welcoming group, you're part of the greeters then too. You open the door for somebody then, but you just don't open a door. You know, you're there to be able to, some people may come in, you know, very friendly and want to just say hello to you. Some people are looking down and say, are you all right? You know, you just want to be able to recognize what the needs are, you know, something, you know, whatever, and provide for those needs. And in providing for those needs then too, one of the things that we want to be able to welcome people to, and we spoke about how important hospitality was with meals and things like that, so we want to always be able to invite people to the feast. And what is the greatest feast that we can come to now? 
is the peace to the Eucharist, inviting them to Mass, I mean, welcoming them. Now, it's different when you're opening the door as a greeter here at church. You already know that they're here, you know? Okay? We want to be welcoming them, too. But in our other circumstances, welcoming them to the Eucharist and eventually welcoming them to the heavenly banquet, you know, to allow them to be able to talk about heaven and things like that. You know, and serving others and to seeing Christ in whom? In the least of our brothers and sisters. That was the emphasis. The least of my brothers and sisters. You know, that's what Christ relates to. Whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did to me. So that's important to be able to, Jesus is speaking, recognize my presence, recognize the godliness in the people that you consider the least. And what you did to them, you did to me. And so we have to ask ourselves the questions, what am I here for? Am I here to be served? Or am I here to serve others? And it's not enough just to go ahead and do the right thing. We need to be able to do the right thing for the right reason, the why behind the what. We always have to have the right why. And we know what that's all dependent on, love. The love that God gives us and the love that we need to share. And then we need to be able to serve with humility and to serve with so now we're on our final session today, which is about teaching others with Christ. So the prayer is going to rely, to, to, uh, to focus on that. And so let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, your spirit of wisdom fills the earth and teaches us your ways. You have called all of us to be teachers, and may we strive to share our knowledge with gentle patience, and to endeavor always to bring the truth to eager minds. Grant that we may follow Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and life, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. So each week it's been a challenge just to see what do we do, and how we focus on, on this, you know, about you know, how are we to bring Christ, you know, proclaim Christ, welcome Christ, serve with Christ. And so today is teaching. And uh, it's interesting because I think, you know, all of us have to recognize that we are all called, because on, on the basis of our baptism, we are all called to preach and to teach. And so when we're talking about preaching and teaching, I think the best thing that we can do as always, is to go back and to look at Jesus as our model. So we don't even, you know, to, I want to focus today on looking at Jesus as the teacher, but looking at different situations and different scenarios in how did Jesus teach? What did Jesus do in order to be able to allow others to understand his particular situation? So. In many respects, as a teacher, Jesus operated as the mode of a prophet. And someone once says that prophets have a way of comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And if you think about it, that's exactly what they do. Those that are in need are down in the cast, they want to bring them up. And those that are feeling real good about themselves are going to say, hey, but what about, oh, I don't want to hear that, you know? That's what a prophet does. And so that's what Jesus did. And despite his often fiery, provocative stances that appeared that he was taking, many people came to him. I'll give you an example, one from each gospel, from Matthew. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. In John's gospel, it said, uh, the one who was sent to arrest Jesus, the temple guard, came empty-handed, saying, No one ever spoke like that man. In Luke's gospel, it all spoke well of him, and wondered at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And in Mark, the common people heard him gladly. Jesus was a complex preacher and teacher. And so what I want to do is I want to consider some of the qualities that Jesus used in his teaching and 
perhaps uh, the, the, and the balance that he manifested in doing that, which will be a great when we listen to the scriptures, see about how Jesus was doing this and how that might help me in my life and being able to do my what God is calling me to do then too. Well, the first thing is we spoke about in the, uh, in, the in, in that little brief thing this, uh, from from Matthew. Jesus spoke with his authority. You know the authority that you know he. The, the word for authority actually means speaking from his own substance. And that was easy for Jesus because Jesus was God, right? And so Jesus knew how to speak about the scriptures. How often did Jesus say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So he's going to continue on. He's going to explain because he has that kind of authority. Jesus spoke from the experience of knowing his father and knowing the cherished law and knowing the truth of his own life. So he brought that personal weight of what he said and what he knew and he, what he spoke. So he's not teaching people about something that he knows about. This is something that indeed is a part of him. So what are we called to do? We are called to speak about our experience of our faith, about how we know the Lord in our own life, and how we are able to speak that with our own authority. So, you know, everything about the Lord, everything about the church, and everything about what we teach, you know, we, uh, we, we should have been able to test this in our own lives, okay, in ways. Because we're human, okay? Now, Jesus is God. Jesus was always going to do the will of his Father, right? Okay? Jesus always did the right thing. We can't say the same thing, but we know that we have been tried and tested many times. And so, so many times we have tried and tested ways that we should not have. And we know that. And we found that we are able to come back and this is what we do because we know. And I have grown in my faith and I have grown in my prayer. And all of this is true. But this goes really hand in hand for us, not only authority, but the second point that we go is talk about his witness. So, if Jesus talks about his witness, and a witness is someone who has seen, recounts what they have seen or heard with their own eyes and ears. So, this is, we're talking about something about a witness. So, a witness knows themselves what they experienced. So Jesus, speaking as a witness, would say, if I were to say to you that I do not know him, I said, how can you tell this? You, know, you call yourself the son of God. Okay, he's talking about that. So Jesus says to him, if I was going to tell you that I didn't know him, talking about God, then I would be a liar, just like you. But I do know him, and I do keep his word. So he's not just repeating what others have said. Now, while we can't immediately witness to all that Jesus does, we can speak to what the Lord does in our own life and how we've come to know him by conforming to the word of God. If you've ever been on a retreat, okay, sometimes parish retreats or whatever that it is then too, one, of the, one component of a retreat that is usually there are people who are able to give witness talks have you heard people get up to give witness talks? The truth of the matter is, every single person here could get up and give a witness talk to God in their life in some capacity. Now, sometimes we think, well, I can think of the situation, but it's only minor, it's only trivial. When you think about, you know, some of the amazing things that people have happened, that, you know, God, I prayed for this and this happened and whatever and things like that. These are the kinds of things that will but witness talk is so powerful. They're powerful in the truth because you are speaking with authority. You have seen, you have heard. This is how God has touched my life. This is how we teach Jesus with others. We need to be able to share what we have witnessed, what we experience with others. Okay. One of the other qualities of Jesus as a teacher was respect. Okay? He respected. Now, I, I say respect, but if you go back to the word respect, the meaning go from, you take the, 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 the word, re, 
spectacular. Okay, so ray means again, spectacular means to look. So it means to look again, okay, means to re respect. And so frequently in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Mark, you will see a line that will start in the Gospels and it will say something like, Jesus looked at them and said, so Jesus looked at them. So we're talking about the respect of being able to look at people. Jesus was not just thief, was just going out there talking just you know, to a faceless crowd. He <clears throat> looks at them. He looks at you. Okay, think about that when Jesus, you know, as he speaks to the crowd, Jesus is speaking to me. Jesus is looking at me. You know, he's teaching us not merely as a crowd. He's teaching what he is saying is not for the crowd only. It is for you. You know, he is looking at us and looking again. Are we looking back at him? Are we listening to Jesus then too? You know, so when we think about this, we think about how we teach. You know, um, you know how we, you know, when we're called to teach someone, or even called like in raising our children, are we talking to them? Are we looking at them? Are we looking at them with love and respect, recognizing that this is the message that bears for you? Do we engage them by the way that we challenge them with our looks? And the same thing, too, with people that we have. It's one of the things that we do. We just don't want to speak to them or speak at them. We want to recognize them for who they are. Okay? And that goes along with saying that Jesus had a lot of, you know, he, Jesus has love. Yeah, we know that. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus is all about. But in his love, Jesus had a lot of patience with people. I mean, you can look at the apostles first and foremost. You think that, you know, they weren't exactly, you know, well trained right from the start. I mean, he had to train them. He had to push them along. They didn't get it a lot of the times. And, but he was patient. He's willing to stay with us. You know, he, uh, you know, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And when he saw them, he just had to begin to teach them great life. Because he saw them and he knew what they needed. And they needed him. And he was there with them. And there's two great examples in the Gospel of John. You know, just talking about how patient Jesus can be with us sometimes. First is somebody that we heard about in today's Gospel. That's a little fast forward. Okay, One of the persons that spoke up and nobody was really too crazy about him at that time, and that was Nicodemus, okay? Nicodemus spoke up, and what about Nicodemus' first encounter with Jesus? Now, he had been following, he was one of the Pharisees, he was among the Pharisees, and they're putting him down, but he's interested. He wants to know a little bit more about Jesus. So what does Nicodemus do? He goes to talk to Jesus at night, when nobody else will see, because he wants to ask him a few questions. And so in that setting, at night, he talks to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs you are doing unless God is with them. And then Jesus answered him, says, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus is gone. Hmm. How can a person grow, once grown old be born again? Surely we can't re-enter the mother's womb and be born again, can we? So, he said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is born of the flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you, you must be born from above. Because the wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound that it makes, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everybody who is born of the Spirit. And then they do, how can this happen? And Jesus said to him, you are a teacher. You are a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand this? Amen, amen, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we testify for what we have seen, 
but you people do not accept my testimony. If I tell you about earthly things, you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And then he goes on to say that God so loved the world that he's, it said his own. So he's patient. He's patient with Nicodemus. He goes and he does, and he, he's doing this, and he's trying this, and he's asking, asking questions about this, and we'll talk about that a little bit. He's asking him questions, and he's making him realize. But, that, but that's not trying to open himself up a little bit more. Not so long after that, he does the same thing too. <clears throat> so he came to a town of Samaria, near Sychar, near a plot of land that Jacob had given to Joseph at will. And a woman came to draw water, and Jesus said, give me a drink. His disciples had already gone away to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? So Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God who was saying it to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket, you know, and the cistern is deep. You know, where are you going to get this living water, okay? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this cistern and drank from it himself with his children, with his flocks? Jesus is very calm. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give will never thirst. The water I will give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then she finally says, well, sir, give me this water so that I may go and may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to the well and keep drawing all of this water. And then he said, well, go call your husband. Come back. And the woman answered and said to him, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right in saying that you don't have a husband. You've already had five. And the man you're with now is not your husband. <clears throat> and the woman said, all right, sir, what you say is true. So I can see your problem. And then he goes on and on. You know the rest of the story as it goes on from then. And eventually, eventually, after that patience and after the talking, he finally says, she says, well, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who is called the Anointed One when he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said, I am he, the one who is speaking about. So he couldn't come out and just say, hey, I'm the Messiah, give me a drink. He had to let her come to this, just the way he had to let Nicodemus come to this. <clears throat> too. So patience, patience, you know, how long have he, have, did he have conversations with the apostles then too? That was it. Okay. So he had the capacity then, as I said, you know, to, you know, to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable then too. And so, you know, we know that God is love and everything, and, and, and that's true. And so when we talk about his preaching and his teaching, Jesus wants to speak and wants to comfort people. But he also, he also, you know, wants to be able to afflict those who feel a little bit comfortable. So, in Luke's Gospel, as he's giving the Sermon on the Plain, very easily he goes, Blessed are you who are poor, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are those who are now hungry, you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who are now weeping, you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and they insult you, and denounce your name as evil on account of me. Rejoice and leap for joy that day, for your reward will be great in heaven. And he goes on, now it's time to afflict the comfortable. But woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. And woe to you who laugh now, you will grieve and weep. Woe to you who speak well when people speak well of you, for their ancestors treated the false prophets in this way. 
goes on and on. You see what he's saying? So he knows what to do in every situation. <coughs> I'll give you one more, uh, the last one that we're going to read from here, uh, from, the, from the Bible as far as this goes. But one more time, um, when you talk about comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, okay? So we got a little bit of both. When I talked about it, the apostles really gave Jesus a run for his money sometimes, okay? So when Jesus went to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they were all answering, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. You know, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for blessed for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly just told his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. But, then Peter took him aside, and then he started telling his disciples that the Messiah, that he has to go to Jerusalem to suffer greatly from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and to be killed, and then on the third day he will rise. And Peter's listening to this, and he took Jesus aside, and he said, God forbid, Lord, no such thing should happen to you. And then, from saying, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, now he said, get behind me, Satan. You know, you are an obstacle to me. You are not thinking as God does. You are thinking as human beings do. So, you've got to know when you have to comfort, and you've got to know when you've got to afflict a little bit then too. So, one of Jesus' greatest teaching aids was parables. Jesus taught in parables. I mean, gosh, I, they're, they're, I think there's like over 45 parables, you know, and some of the parables are full stories. Some of the parables are just brief images. They're sometimes, you know, pretty, com you know, complex teachings about everyday life. Parables plant seeds. Seeds to be their future reflections. They're kind of like riddles then too that you have to think of. So there's so many parables. You gotta have a favorite parable. I mean there are so many of them out there. You think about parables about everything. You hear about the parable of you know the prodigal son, the parable about the good Samaritan, the parable about the good shepherd and, and things like that. You know, you talk about the parable of the wise virgins, you know? They talk about, uh, about parables about everything that they can think about. Anybody got a favorite parable that they like? That they, or, or anybody that really sticks out at you? Like uh, trying to find the pearl of greatest price, you know? Or how about the people that go out to work all day long and people that come in at the last hour and they all get paid the same way, you know? Or how about a parable about the servant that was, you know, squandering some of the money, okay? So think about this, about the, 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 the parable. You know, uh, you know he, he went and he just said, and he wouldn't forgive somebody that had owed so much less than that. All these parables are wonderful, every single one of them, because it gets us to think. It gets us to think and it allows us to put things in different situations. And so it's important for us not only to remember the parables and to think about the parables and teach the parables, but how about other parables that you can think of in your own life? Are there other situations or things that you can think about, maybe not that happened in your own life, or maybe something that you read recently. Maybe something, you know, in a book. I mean, I remember once talking about, can you talk to kids? And you think about 
how are you going to teach them about heaven or things like that and whatever, or you're someplace that looks whatever, you know, like, so well, let's see The Wizard of Oz. You ever seen the movie The Wizard of Oz? Okay, you go in Oz, what's the, what's, what's the thing there? There's no place like home. Well, where's our home? And St. Paul teaches us that, you know, we're here on earth, but this isn't our real home. Our home is getting there for us. So you can give them the image of that, like, you know, they were in Oz and it looked great and whatever, but there were a lot of not so nice things there too. And they wanted to wait, be able to go home, whatever. So I, I teach, uh, or sometimes when I uh, have different funerals, I use this. And I, I consider this fall into the category of like a parable. If you're familiar at all with Henry Nowen, he's a spiritual writer. Okay? So Henry Nowen, um, from the book God's Gift on Death and Dying, use this analogy, which I would consider kind of a parable. Part of his life, he would travel with a, he traveled with a uh, traveling circus, okay? So a circus. So the high point of the circus was this trapeze artist who he called Joe. He was the, the highlight, he was the, 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 the big star, okay? And so, you know, he would go and he would do all these incredible stunts high above, you know, and to the, Thunderous applause of all of the people. And so Henry Nowen once asked him, how does it feel to be the star? And they said, I'm not the star. The star of the show is my catcher. He's the one who places himself at the right place, at the right time, to always be there to catch me so that I don't fall. And then Henry Nowen thought about that. What a beautiful analogy about how Christ is in our life. But how many moments in our life is Christ there to catch us? Especially when we take our last breath, when we leave go of this bar of our earthly one. So be ready to catch us, to take us to our new place, our new home, you know, for eternal life. So people can give us these ideas and these ways of being able to teach because Jesus used parables for a reason. He put pe things that people could understand and really allowed them to really think about these things as well, too. Yeah. So, very, you know, parable leaves a person wanting more, okay? You want to think about more than how things go, okay? Parables, parables. Then, that goes along with Jesus and questions. One of these days, or when, 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 you, when you're reading the scriptures, really focus on questions, because remember, if the, if the scriptures are what we believe, and they are the living word of God, then that means that the scriptures are speaking to all of us at all the time. So that means that the questions that Jesus asks in the scriptures to different people are questions that he's asking of all of us too. And sometimes it's a good thing just to be able to point and reflect. And we certainly can ask people different questions about different things. Yeah. So, I'll give you an example. So, somebody actually wrote an article about, uh, this article was 100 questions that Jesus asked that you must answer. And this is obviously not a complete source of anything else like what like Jesus did. So, you know, why are you terrified? Do you believe that I can do this? To what shall I compare this generation's? How can anyone enter a strong man's house and take hold of his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Why did you doubt? Do you not yet understand? But who do you say that I am? Why do you ask me about what is good? Did you never read the scriptures? Why are you testing me? Could you not watch for me for one brief hour? Why are you thinking such things in your heart? Why this commotion and weeping? What were you arguing about on the way? 
Why were you looking for me? What are you thinking in your hearts? Where is your faith? Will you be exalted in heaven? Did not the maker of the outside also make the inside? Why do you judge for yourself what is right? Has none but this foreigner returned to give thanks to God? But when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? What are you looking for? How does this concern of you affect me? Do you want to be well? Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? Do you want to also leave me? Why are you trying to kill me? If I am telling you the truth, why do you not believe me? Do you believe this? Who are you looking for? Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Do you love me? Arbitrarily just picked out a couple as I was reading along. There's tons of them. And Jesus asks a question. Listen, when you read the scriptures or listen to the scriptures, think of that question directly to you. But also think about how important that is. The question is directed to others. And we go back, and this goes back to the, you know, even when, you know, in the Greek times, you know, that's what they love to do. They, I call them that, like, arguing. It's like you put a bunch of used car salesmen together and see, you know, who's going to get the best price or whatever, you know, something like that. You know, no, I'm not doing Putting down used car salesmen, you know, anybody's a used car salesman. But, uh, you know, just uh, trying to haggle, you know, a little bit, you know, just something like that. But, like, you know, in Socratic methods, use questions to get to the truth. So, you know, it's like, just like with a little kid, okay? You get the little kid when they get to a certain age, you know, or you know, they say, why? Why that? Well, you have to, why? 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 How many times can they say the question, why? And you gotta come up with an answer until finally you go, well, he's like, because I told you so, and don't ask me why again, you know, that's what he did. But they ask him, why did you ask that? What do you mean by that? Do you think there's any distinctions to their claim? And they would do this, and they do this, and they do. That's what they did all day. That would exhaust me. You know? but that's what they did all day. You know? So, okay, all right. So, sometimes when one of the examples that, that Jesus would use in trying to teach about him, obviously there are so many different types of situations and types of things that we can concern ourselves with. How can we, especially if we're teaching, we're teaching more than one or if we're just like just talking to individuals and we're not sure about everything, sometimes if we can use what what um, what would what, what would be referred to as like using focal points or focal instances to try to get across a message that can really <coughs> focus on many different kinds of things, because you know where he wanted to illustrate principles and laws. Uh, that are not merely there just to keep minimal requirements, okay? He wants us to go deeper into some things. So he uses several examples for instances like that. Because he used the Ten Commandments, okay? We know all this, okay? So, thou shalt not kill, okay? Anybody murder anybody today? Mm -hmm. All right, you're all good, okay? Go in peace, okay? Well, we know there's more to it than that, okay? Uh, so Jesus had no problem speaking about anger and lust and divorce. Oaths, retaliation, love of enemies, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, okay? Remember last week when we talked about, you know, who are we to serve, you know? When did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, whatever? Jesus teaches, what you do to the least of my brothers, you do to me. So he's pointing out a focus group. Those who you consider least, that's where you are going to find me, okay? Focal point about prayer. I remember the situation that he pointed out to the, uh, to, the to his apostles. Just go around. Look, look over there. Here's the Pharisee. The Pharisee's in the temple. Thank you, God, that I am not like these other people. I pay my tithes. I do this. I do that. That's his prayer. That's his prayer. And then 
go see the tax collector. Won't even raise his head. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Who is speaking? Who is doing this prayer for two? Same thing too. He goes, Jesus goes in the temple, he's teaching them too. He says, You get people in going in, you know. Uh, uh, I have, you know, God bless, I, mean, I, I use this as an example. God, uh, God rest his soul. I mean, I love him dearly. Uh, he was my uncle, he was my uncle, he was my aunt's husband. And uh, he would always come and he uh, he was what you would call a little tight with his money. Okay? He is frugal. Okay, let's call him frugal. Okay. But when he would do something, I mean, I remember I like, and he's also my godfather, okay? He's my godfather. <laughs> and so when it comes time he would be there like it would be an occasion. I was just a little kid. But I would always like we were always around. And it was so he would go out and he would play out. You know, he would at that time it would be like a five dollar bill. He would have, and everybody would see that he's giving me a, and he'd come around, I can not see like that, so, 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 so you remember the examples like uh, Jesus, you know, pointing out different people that are giving, but, you know, they're giving, but look at what they're wearing. I mean, they've got the finest clothes, they've got everything else like that, they're giving their tithes, whatever, they're giving from their surplus. But then he sees this poor woman that comes over, takes the pennies out of her, she's giving from her want. This is what she's living on, and she is still giving that to him. So he uses this, these beautiful examples of trying to show these focal points, you know, in order to be able to allow ourselves to understand and to see that it's not just what we do, it's why we do it and where we give and all of those reasons for it. So, these are not exhaustive treatments of the, of the uh, moral life by any means, but they apply to so many other situations. And so you can't envision every situation, but you can give different examples of what it means to truly be there for others, or truly give to others, or truly, you know, just you know, the, uh, what, what, whatever particular situation or circumstances. Another thing that Jesus used a lot, which is good, and yeah, I, I'm be hard pressed. I'll, I'll have to try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and think. I'll put this up once, but I don't know yet. Um, hyperbole. Okay, a hyperbole is an exaggerated statement, not to be taken literally. Okay. All right. So Jesus gave some beauties you know, in his time. Okay. All right, he's, he's a pretty, pretty easy guy, he says. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get to heaven. Okay? All right. I, 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 I used this before. Remember that uh, man who owed the money? There was a man who owed 10,000 talents. Do you know what 10,000 talents really came to in terms of uh, money? as far as, at that time, a talent. A talent was 100,000 years wages. Can you imagine? 100,000 years wages is what he owed the master. Now, you can't even imagine how he could have even gone through that much money, or anybody had that much money, but that is like, you're, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're exaggerating, okay? You're exaggerating to make the point. But, uh, so, someone owed me a billion dollars, okay? And I forgave him. And this guy owes me 20 bucks, and I have him thrown in prison, okay? It's the same type of analogy as you're doing that then, too. So, you know, it's, uh, it would be better for you to be cast in the sea with a great millstone around your neck than to scandalize a child. Or, how about this one? No, I'm good. Watch where you're looking. If your eye scandalizes you, what are you supposed to do with it? Pluck it out, okay? You're not supposed to really pluck it out. It's hard to do. So, so you gotta, you got to choose your right moments to do this. So, like, would it be appropriate, perhaps, 
is it the right moment for me to get up on the pulpit and say, go to Mass or go to hell? Okay, that's my moment. <laughs> <home. laughs> well, you know, that is, no, that leads me at that. That's a, actually, that's perfect. Because that leads me into the next thing that Jesus talked about. Jesus is all about love, but he didn't tell everybody, you know, that everything is good and fine and, and everything is hunky-dory, right? They didn't talk about everything was love. It, it, there wasn't, it wasn't bad for him to use fear, a little fear-based arguments. Everybody needs a little bit of fear in their life when it comes to motivation for what we should or should not do. He warned of hell. He warned of unquenchable fires. He warned of this worm that never dies. And he lists a lot of summary judgments. People who are unprepared. People who will be excluded for heaven. People who are cast into the darkness. Jesus warns you're going to hear wailing and grinding of teeth. He talks about this permanent abyss between heaven and hell. So, <laughs> it's funny. Jesus uses them a lot. So, like, if Jesus was here today, he probably would never get the memo that this is not politically correct and this is a poor way to teach, right? You know, but, uh, so, so, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily bring that up and say that in every situation or every circumstance, but certainly it is the truth. So, to teach as Jesus did has to include all of these warnings about judgment and hell, because they're there. You know, it's a, otherwise, there's nothing to really align us up for what we are supposed to do. Because, again, all of these things are consistent as they go on. Jesus refused to compromise. When he's teaching, Jesus would never compromise. He never, you know, th there was little compromise about the serious teachings of doctrine or issues relating to our salvation. Because he was very clear. You know, either we believe in Jesus or we're going to die to our sins. And Jesus said, I am the only way to the Father, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. He talked about, you know, when He said, come and follow me. Remember those stories there, the examples? He said, well, let me just finish plowing this field, you know, till whatever. So He says, no one who sets a hand to the plow to look back was fit for the reign of God. Of course, we all know this one. Jesus said, He who would not deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, is not worthy of him. We are told to cost, count the cost and decide now, and we war that delay may be deadly. So, too often today we want a Christianity that is much softer. We live in a world where we can love, we think that we can live in a world that we can love the world and also love God. Jesus is pretty clear about that. A friend of the world is an enemy to God. We see it all the time. That does not mean that things of the world are bad enough for themselves, but if we're not free to let go of all of them and only hold on to God, we end up holding on to the things of this world and letting go of God. And that's going to be our disaster. Our disaster. <coughs> the reason that he was so insistent and never compromised because these are the truths for our salvation. And if we follow these truths vaguely or inconsistently, we will not win. Some of the disciplines need to be followed precisely. And so if we want to teach people about Jesus, it insists on the fundamental doctrines of our faith to be accepted fully and wholeheartedly. Oh, well, you want to be Catholic? You don't want to believe in these couple of things? Oh, sure, come on, that's okay. Jesus is insisting. This is the way.
You know, got to let go of, you know, <laughs> then you can use all of those other kinds of things, like other questions, the and things like that, in order to be able to get to them, to find out where it is. If we want to accept Jesus, we have to accept you know, it's, 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 it's like the gospel message then, too. He says, well, you know, he's from Galilee. He can't be the Christ or whatever, too. Of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You know, but he's you know, from, from Galilee. So, you know, they're, they're going on a reason why they shouldn't listen to him because he was making them uncomfortable because they, they were living the way they should not be. You know, one of the other things, too, is also about forgiveness. So forgiveness may not be an obvious way that we teach, but obviously it was important to Jesus. Because think about a teacher. A teacher has to accept students that don't get everything right the first time. Right? Now that might be when you're teaching math. And this might be just about living life in general. We make mistakes, sometimes, over and over and over again. So we need that patience, okay, as Jesus exhibits. We need to be able to show that forgiveness. The standards are high standards, but Jesus offers forgiveness, not as a way of denying perfection, but to facilitate our advancement by grace and by trust. Lots of things that Jesus gives us and teaches us and wants us to be able to do, which is really the final thing to do, and that is to train. We teach people so that they can teach others. That is really the cornerstone of our faith. As we bring new life into the world, as parents, you are given the responsibility to be able to raise your children up not only so that they can grow and live and be happy, but also that they grow in the truth and knowledge of the Lord. And we teach them in the hopes that they will continue to be able to teach others as well, too. So one of the greatest ways to do that is be able to really give them a good foundation for their for teaching. But remember, as all the things that Jesus has taught us and all the things that we've reflected on today, this teaching doesn't mean that we have to memorize chapter and verse up here. That we can quote the scriptures like that, although it's wonderful when we can. But we have to know what Jesus is teaching and do our best to try to be able to live that teaching out and to share that teaching with others. And it's not just being able to bring that teaching along, but to use that patience, that love, that listening, that seeing, that respecting the people that we are, not talking down to them like a Pharisee, but really being able to try to lift them up, to use all of these countercultural ways that Jesus teaches us that heaven is like, that we are living in this topsy-turvy world in order to be able to teach Christ to others. So I thank you all for you know coming together for the for those of you who have been here for the five sessions or, or whatever, just in different types of ways to how we can really show Christ in so many different ways to others just by looking to Christ and his example. And that's what we have to look at, and that's what we still have the scriptures, we have all these wonderful ways in the Eucharist, the sacraments, to be able to keep us close to Christ and to allow us to be able to receive him both in word and in, in himself. And so, I can't think of a more perfect way of ending than with a prayer that, who taught us? Jesus. Which would be the perfect prayer as we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
All right, God bless you all. Happy St. Patty's Day. Happy St. Joseph's Day. Happy, happy life. Yeah. <laughs>